Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back. I hope that you had a great networking lunch. Let's move forward with the next panel discussion on uh, Spotlight on the services chapter, opportunities and the modes of market access. Well, uh, for this, let me invite Dr. Sunil Boudou, the Director of International Trade Division at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Regional Integration and International Trade, who will moderate the panel. Okay, uh, good afternoon. I know it's a bit hot, uh, but uh, we hope you know that everything will be fine. There may be some problem with the AC. Uh, so I'll be your uh, moderator for the next session today. And um, let me see. So basically, it's about a snapshot of the trading services agreement, and then we are going to have a look at uh, some sectors. Uh, uh, and uh, basically how we are going to take advantage in those sectors. And I've got uh, three panelists. Unfortunately, there was the fourth one, Mr. Chintaram, understand that uh, he has not been able to make it. So I'd like to invite on the stage here our panelists. I think that they are fixing the uh, mic, no, please. So, uh, Boniqui, please, uh, who is the Chief Executive Officer of HSBC Mauritius, please join us. Yes. Uh, so, the next one, uh, so I think that, yes, we we'll just wait. Okay, so Mr. Matonki here, good. And then we'll have Mr. Uh, Rajnis Hawaii. So just clap for him. Yes. Good. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to just briefly introduce uh, our panelists. And then I intend to make a very brief sort of presentation on, because you need to know what is in the agreement of the role before we start the discussion. So I'm going to make a very brief sort of uh, presentation. And then, of course, we are going to uh, have some discussion and brainstorm of what uh, we do to take advantage. Uh, so, um, as I indicated, uh, Boniqui, she is the Chief Executive Officer of HSBC in Mauritius. She joined HSBC in Mauritius from Hong Kong, where she was global head of Premier and JID within HSBC's wealth and personal banking business, and led the establishment of the bank's JID proposition into a differentiated wealth and lifestyle proposition for high net worth clients. Prior to this, she led HSBC WPB business in mainland China and Taiwan. Uh, she joined HSBC in 2002 as a graduate trainee based in London. Uh, Bonnie is an associate of the Chartered Institute of Bankers and holds degrees from Queen's Mary and Westfield College and King's College, University of London. She is married with two children. Uh, my friend Rajneesh, uh, I think that you know him. He began his career as an analyst programmer at Blanche Biaget Company Limited from 1996 to 1999. He served as assistant manager at the Industrial Vocational Training Board. From 1999 to 2003, he was IT manager at the Cargo Handling Corporation Limited. From 2003 to 2006 and 2007 to 2008, he served as project manager at Central Informatics Bureau and was on second at the SADC Secretariat under the Young Professional Program 
from 2006 to 2007. Uh, from 2008 to 14, he served as acting director at the uh, CIB. And in 2014, he was appointed chief technical officer at the Ministry of Information Technology, Communication and Innovation. And uh, Mr. Twali Batonki is a partner at Deloitte Mauritius. Mr. Talib is a national leader for the audit and advisory practice at Deloitte Mauritius. He's a fellow a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales and has over 25 years of professional experience across all service lines, including audit and advisory services, taxation, corporate finance, and financial advisory, and are the lead client service partner for some of the largest <coughs> domestic as well as international uh, clients based in Mauritius. He also leads the international tax practice of Deloitte Mauritius. So, ladies and gentlemen, you can just applaud for them. So they are real professionals in the fields, <laughs> and I'm sure that we are going to benefit from their expertise. Having said this, so uh, as I indicated before, uh, I would very quickly uh, just make a, a brief presentation of the uh, FTA with China. And I think that this presentation will help you understand what is in the agreement, but more importantly, there are certain concepts that uh, you'll need to be aware of, because if you don't understand these concepts, it will be extremely difficult for you to understand what is it that we have negotiated. Uh, and so let's get started. Okay. Um, just to indicate the size of the Chinese market in terms of services, and I think that this, uh, these figures were mentioned uh, in the minister's statement this, uh, this morning. So the import of services in China in 2019 was 776 billion US dollars. So you can understand what we are talking about. Multiply this by 40, and you will end up with trillions uh, of rupees. Uh, a lot of trillions, <coughs> matter of fact. And there has been an annual uh, growth rate of services, uh, so 7.8%. Uh, uh, there have been uh, some uh, robust development in a uh, number of sectors, in telecommunication, medical services, computer, computer information services, financial services, etc., etc., as you can see. Now, uh, I just want to very quickly get into, as I said, some of the provisions. Uh, in the services chapter, so we have got a number of uh, articles. First and foremost, uh, we all know that the most favored nation treatment principle uh, is a, it's one of the key principles in any argument. Basically, we are talking about non-discrimination, so that you don't discriminate. You can't discriminate you know, um, services coming from, from China, and of course, China isn't going to discriminate. So this is a key uh, uh, principle in the argument. Uh, uh, it, the argument also provides that, you know, uh, we have got the right to, uh, to have our own domestic regulations. Uh, of course, uh, nobody can prevent you from regulating services. The only thing is that if you are having your domestic regulations, you need to make sure that these regulations, they do not basically constitute a barrier to trade. And this is what we have included in the agreement. Uh, there is an article on recognition. Uh, basically, we are talking, when we are talking about, uh, about uh, trading services, so we talk about professionals, about qualifications, about education, uh, about the license which you have to issue. Uh, so basically, there is a need for us to recognize this. And there is a process uh, which has been agreed in the argument where we can sit down and then uh, sit with the Chinese side uh, where we are going to negotiate equivalence and we see how we recognize. I mean. Uh, these qualification licenses, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, always in all uh, trading services agreement, there are certain areas which are excluded. Uh, first and foremost, of course, you have got all services that fall under the authority of the government. Normally, they're excluded. For instance, Mauritius, you know, we don't include uh, utilities, electricity, water. I mean, and these are services falling under the authority of government, so these are excluded from the scope of the agreement, and it is uh, the same thing here. Uh, we also have excluded air traffic rights uh, for one very simple reason, because normally uh, traffic rights uh, negotiations are done on the basis of bazaars, so bilateral air uh, traffic services agreement. So it's excluded from the scope of this agreement. 
Government procurement uh, is excluded. Cabotage in maritime uh, transport services is also excluded. So basically, I mean, when the slips, ships, vessels plying between uh, Mauritius and, uh, and, and Rodrigues, for instance, so that is excluded from the scope of it. I already uh, mentioned about services provided uh, in the th exercise of government authority. Grants or subsidies, they're excluded as well as citizenship, uh, residence, employment on a permanent basis. So in any way, I think that I'll just very briefly mention about uh, one mode, which is mode four, of the movement of natural persons. Uh, that is allowed, but under certain conditions. So apart from these uh, basic principles and the articles, we have got also three uh, annexes contained very specifically, addressing uh, financial services, movement of natural person, and there is also one annex on traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, normally, when you are negotiating an agreement uh, uh, with any country, of course, uh, with China, so you have to agree on the framework, and then you have to negotiate something which is called the schedule of commitments. And this is the most important part, because when we talk about schedule of commitments, it means to say the commitments that are taken by each of the parties to open up the market. And it is... Uh, included in what we call a schedule, it's a format. And uh, we are going to have a look at it because if you don't understand this one, then there is an issue. Uh, we really need to capture, to understand the concept, uh, and that will help you uh, basically to follow uh, what you're talking about. And normally in the schedule of commitment, you have got what we call horizontal commitment, so commitment that would be applicable to all the services sectors. And then we have got sectoral commitments, so commitments that are applicable specifically to uh, sectors, uh, uh, education, health, and, I mean, these are what you call sectoral commitments. Now, now you have to follow me very, very closely. <laughs> it's a bit technical, but I think that we really need to understand this, to understand what we have negotiated. Yesterday, we were talking about trading goods. So we all know when you're negotiating an agreement on trading goods, what you would normally do is that you will, be, you will eliminate what we call uh, the duties, the tariffs on goods. And you will also eliminate, as far as possible, non-tariff barriers. So it's very clear to understand. For instance, uh, sometimes, you know, the products, uh, let's say we are importing garments into Mauritius. If we apply a duty of 10%, so in the negotiations, what we are going to do, we are going to eliminate as far as possible. This is what normally happens when it comes to trading goods. But when it comes to trading services, it's a bit different. And uh, you have to understand how services are traded to start with. And normally ser services are traded according to modes of supply of a service. And there are four different modes. We have got the first mode, mode one, it is cross-border supply. You have got uh, mode two, which is consumption abroad. Mode three is commercial presence, and mode four, movement of natural person. Let me explain each one of these modes. Now, when we are talking about mode one, that is a cross-border supply of a service, what it means is that the service is being supplied from the territory of a country, let's say uh, from Mauritius, into the territory of another country. In this case, it's China. And the supply is done through communications mode can be through internet, can be through telephone, it can be through fax. So this is how the service is provided. And you can provide many services. For instance, uh, uh, let's say we have got the BPO uh, business process outsourcing in Mauritius. It is done th through mode one. So the company is here in Mauritius providing the service. Tomorrow, for instance, you can provide uh, translation services. There's no need for you to move to another country to provide the translation. You can do it here, and then you send it through the internet. Uh, you can provide medical services. A doctor can consult a patient. No need for him really to have physical. He can do this through the internet. And now uh, we have got video conferences. You can, you can do it uh, through video conferencing. An architect can uh, do the drawing of a building by being here in Mauritius, and then he will just send uh, that to his client in, uh, in China. So this is mode one. Now, this is the most important mode for Mauritius. Why? We are very small, <coughs> and 
And you know, it will be very difficult for service providers for Mauritius all the time to go to another country, set up a company there. And then when you set up a company, there are so many procedures that you have to meet, licensing requirements, there are many things. Uh, then, you know, you have board of directors, uh, you know, and each country has got its own, uh, what we call, system when it comes to the board of directors. At the end of the day, you may not be having control over your company. So that's why it's easier to provide the service from Mauritius. And this is where I think that if we want to make our Mauritius a service-oriented economy, we have to take advantage of this mode because the person will be here and providing the service from here to China. So this mode is extremely important for Mauritius. And I've just given you some examples of what mode one is. Mode two is the movement of consumers. We call that consumption abroad. Here is the consumer moves to another country to consume the service. Typical example is tourism. A tourist cannot consume the service while in this country, but normally that tourist will have to travel. So to, tourists from China traveling to Mauritius uh, to consume the service. So this is a typical example, but you can take other examples. A student traveling to another country to consume the service, so we have to travel there. Uh, a patient can, you know, travel to another country to have uh, treatment. So this is what we call consumption abroad. The third one, maybe the most important one, is commercial presence or establishment. And here we are talking about foreign direct investment, so a company coming to invest in Mauritius, so a bank, an insurance company, whatever it is. So uh, that company moves to have what we call a physical presence. And as I said, this is important for uh, investment. Sorry? Oh, slide. Oh. You know, I'm talking, but you can. Uh, okay. So I, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. So uh, mode three. So it's about commercial presence. So basically here we're talking. We need one more slide. No. <laughs> mode one is cross-border. Mode two is consumption abroad. Mode three, right? is commercial presence. So this is where we are talking about basically about the physical establishment of a company. And it's about investment. And then we have got mode four, uh, which is a movement of professional on a temporary basis. Don't move on a permanent basis, on a temporary basis. So it means to say that a professional is going to provide uh, his service uh, in another country. So here basically we are talking a Mauritian professional moving to China, or a China, Chinese professional moving to Mauritius to provide the service. So basically what we do in the negotiations, we have to make sure that, you know, on each of the mode, you don't have restrictions. This is what we do. And normally, uh, when we are talking of trading services, the restrictions, they are not in the form of tariffs or non-tariff barriers. The restriction, normally, they are in the laws of the country. That's where the restriction normal, in the legal framework in the regulations of the country. So you have to go through each one of the law, of the law and try to identify you know, where we have got these restrictions, and this is what you negotiate. So basically, you'll be, negotiate, you'll be negotiating to remove restrictions in each of the mode of supply. So, and this, uh, so I hope that you have got it how, first, services are traded. Second, what is it that you negotiate in a trading services agreement? This is what you negotiate. And then, of course, uh, as I said, everything is done in the schedule of commitments. It's a bit like this, the format. We're going to list down uh, the, uh, what do you call, uh, the different sectors, sub uh, subsectors. And for each mode, for instance, here, for herb, and we are taking an extract of uh, Mauritius schedule of commitment. That means the commitment which we have made to the Chinese side. We say that uh, urban planning services, mode one, none. None mean to say that there, there are no restrictions. For this one, there is absolutely no restriction. So somebody want, who wants to provide the service, a Chinese in Mauritius, he will come, incorporate the company. There is no, he can start providing the service. So we don't have any restriction. Uh, so mode two also is known, and mode three, and this is where you have got a small restriction. This is what you try to remove normally. It says that only in the form of a joint venture, with foreign majority uh, ownership permitted. So basically, if a company, Chinese company, wants to provide this service in Mauritius here, 
if they want to be uh, physically present, so they can only do it in joint partnership. So it's not 100% um, uh, that is uh, shareholding. So it has to be done in, in joint partnership. This is what it basically means, right? So in a sense, it means to say that we do have a restriction here, and normally in the negotiation, you will try to remove these restrictions. Uh, so I take it that you have now got a feel of what we are talking about. Now, um, if you look at what we have obtained now on the Chinese uh, market very quickly, So we can have access to land, it says, but may be used by enterprise and it was subject to certain uh, maximum turn limitation for residential, industrial, and other purposes. It's a bit like Mauritius. I mean, you, have, you want to have land, you want to do your business, but there, there are certain restrictions that you have to, uh, to meet. Now, for joint ventures, it's not for all sectors that you will, uh, you will have joint venture requirements. But in sectors where you have joint venture requirements, uh, so there it says that a minimum of 25% capital of the joint venture, a minimum, that is, uh, this is uh, what the requirement is. And uh, there is a possibility uh, for entry and temporary stay of Mauritians in China. Uh, basically, we are talking about short-term visas. Uh, we are not talking about permanent, this is what I said before, that when you are talking about the movement of professionals, so we are not talking about to go and uh, immig to, to emigrate, yeah? no, but you have a time frame within which, of course, you can provide your service, and for that you'll be provided, of course, uh, the, 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 uh, the visa. Uh, and we will, we will have a look at, uh, uh, so for, for business visitors, so you have a visa of 120 20 days, so a business visitor from Mauritius is going to, to China, so they're going to have, so it has to be indicated that he is a, uh, a business visitor, so he will get a visa of 120 days. Uh, so for managers, executives, and specialists, so basically we are talking about intra-corporate transferees, so you have got company here uh, providing the service in China there, and if you have managers who have to move, so they will be given uh, a visa for a period, initial period of three years. Uh, so you can see, you know, it's, it's very good actually. For contract, uh, contractual service suppliers, so basically somebody has got a contract to provide a service in China. So uh, you will have uh, an initial work and stay permit for the maximum of uh, four months. Initial, eh? so it means to say that it can be extended. Now, uh, you can see what you have got uh, for medical and dental services, what it says that Mauritian companies, we can go and, and establish joint venture hospitals or clinic with Chinese partners uh, that is in China. We can do that. And uh, there is a possibility for us to have a maximum shareholding on this one. So it's an opportunity for uh, our clinics willing to open up uh, a branch or whatever it is in, in China. So that is provided. We can also provide legal services, go there uh, in China and provide legal services, we can provide accounting services. So we have already removed the restriction on these different services uh, if you want to provide them, either on a cross-border basis, as I said, because we have got mode one, but not only on a cross-border, but you can be physically present in China to provide these services, to open up a company and provide these services. Uh, for architectural services, engineering, integrated engineering, herbal planning. So basically, you can be wholly, uh, oh, it can be a wholly owned uh, Mauritian entity. No need for joint ventures. So this is, uh, these are some of the, um, what we call the access that we have got on the, on the, on the Chinese market. For financial services, so for non-life insurance, for instance, uh, so Mauritian uh, non-life non insurers can establish as a branch or as a wholly owned subsidiary. So this we can do it for insurance, and I'm sure that uh, there may be interest uh, to provide insurance services. So if a Mauritian company wants to go and provide these services, so this is a requirement. And for life insurance, so uh, Mauritian uh, life insurers would be allowed 51% in terms of equity uh, on the Chinese market. Uh, for banking, so for foreign currency business, Mauritian financial institution can provide services without restriction as to, the, as to clients. So there's no restriction on this one. 
uh, and for local currency business, Mauritian financial institution can provide services to Chinese enterprises. So you can see that basically we have got access, uh, very generous access on the Chinese market. And uh, I don't want to go uh, in all the different sectors because virtually, as I said, there are 100 different, you have got 11 big sectors and, and each sector, you have got a number of sub-sectors and we have got access for all of these uh, different subsectors on the Chinese uh, market. Now, uh, on our side, um, we have also made a uh, commitment, but the commitments taken by Mauritius, basically they are in line with the existing regulatory framework in Mauritius. So we have not gone beyond. Otherwise, you know, if you go beyond what is provided for in our legislation, what it would mean that after uh, you have completed the negotiations or start implementation of the agreement, so then they will, you will have to amend the law. But the way we have framed our uh, commitments, so they are in line with the existing uh, regulatory framework in Mauritius, so basically uh, there is no need uh, for us to amend any legislation. For instance, domestic law, we all know that in Mauritius, uh, FRN cannot practice domestic law. So this is what we have included, that you cannot. But apart from that, if you want to provide advisory services in law, that you can provide. So this is open. Uh, on accounting and auditing, uh, it can only be in the form of a joint venture, right? Uh, for architectural services, uh, you can't do it through mode one, uh, because uh, normally when mode one, uh, if somebody, a foreigner, for instance, a Chinese, they have done a drawing for a building, so that drawing will have to be endorsed by a Mauritian architect. So we have got this in our, in our legislation. So there is uh, what we call, it's not possible through mode one, but it's possible through mode three. So basically, if tomorrow a Chinese uh, uh, company, architect, uh, firm or whatever it is, they want to establish in Mauritius. So that is possible. So as you can see, so we have also taken a number of commitments, but as I indicated, what you need to retain is that these commitments, they are, already, they are in line with the existing uh, regulatory framework in Mauritius. So overall, I think that we have got a very good deal uh, in the services sector. And again, as I said, now it's for us to elaborate strategies to see how we are going to maximize on the benefits. But what you need to retain, more importantly for Mauritius, is mode one. There is no need for any person to be physically present in China to provide the service. They can do that through mode one. And I think that, I think it was, somebody was talking about passporting. Passporting means what? You can provide your service uh, without a lot of hurdles. And mode one is what we call their mode through which you know you can provide because there is no need for you to go uh, to be uh, incorporated in, in in china to provide the service you can provide it from here so th there will be no restriction so that's it for me and if you want to have details of uh, the, the schedule of commitment so you know where to find this we have got the text of the agreement on our website it's on the website of the economic development board so uh, you can have a closer look at it so that's it. That's I, I, what I wanted to, uh, to present to you. And I think that taking what I've just said as a background, so the discussion that we are going to have, it will be in relation to basically what I've just said. And I've got a number of questions. Uh, well, the first question that I'm going to ask, we have got three persons, one financial services, one ICT, and one professional services. What is it in terms of strategy, what is it that Mauritius should do to be able to capitalize on the opportunities that the agreement provides? So for each one of you, uh, you'll have maybe two, three minutes or five minutes. Just try to answer this question. So please. Do we go ladies first? Ladies first, <laughs> that's it. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm a newbie uh, in Mauritius. Um, I represent HSBC. But actually, on the topic of Mauritius-China free trade agreement, I would say that as an organization, HSBC is a very seasoned uh, voice or opinion. Uh, we have been in China for over 155 years, since uh, 1865. And actually, we have been in Mauritius for over 105 years. So on both sides of the two locations, we have been an active banker um, and we should know the landscape pretty well. 
to be giving an opinion. So when you ask the question around the strategy, um, from a banking perspective, actually, I would only really focus on one word, which is digitization. As you mentioned, Mauritius is an island. We're trying to provide services. It's not about goods that are actually going in containers. So it's actually around how do we actually leverage the digital capabilities that are present today. Um, a little bit of that was shared earlier by um, a speaker on Zoom. Uh, it's really around how do you leverage digital to reach all the right stakeholders across the border in China to promote Mauritius? How do we then um, partner with them through digital capabilities? Actually, HSBC is an international bank and one of the most um, highly respected international banks in the world, but we don't feel that it's needed for us to have a physical presence in every location. We can actually cover the scope of Africa without being onshore, necessarily. Um, how do we actually use uh, digital platforms for our clients, such as HSBC Net? And actually, uh, fortunately for Mauritius, during COVID, um, all our clients ran onto the digital platform so that they don't have disruptions to their services. And we're now at over 97% of clients on digital platforms. Uh, so something we're really proud of, but at the same time, we're working on trade settlement across digital ledgers. How do we actually get things done for our clients without having to leave the comfort of your office or even the comfort of your home when you're flexible working? So all these things come into play, but if you say one word, it's digitizing. Very good. So I think that we can then move to uh, Rajneesh because this is what he's supposed to do. <laughs> to make sure that we digitalize the uh, uh, Mauritius. And I think that we need, uh, there are quite a lot of work to do on this one. Uh, how do you think, uh, Rajneesh, we can take advantage and then also to respond to uh, the question which has been asked and uh, what, is it, what is the strategy probably, probably of the ministry uh, regarding this? Because also, as I said, how we take advantage of, uh, of, of this act. Thank you, uh, Sunil. Uh, I think uh, the right word which has been pronounced is digitization. So uh, Mauritius is well placed for taking the digital world into Africa. And the Chinese companies can be located here or overseas, but use the Mauritian uh, uh, springboard to go into, China, into Africa. And uh, this, uh, what is interesting is that from Mauritius, we have uh, today uh, a workforce that is uh, English-speaking and French-speaking, which is bilingual. If we could use that uh, platform for the Chinese companies to come here and to do their, some of the development, some of the help desk services from Mauritius into Africa, into Eastern Africa, into Southern Africa, and even French-speaking Africa. So, from here, provide services into Africa, whether it is technical support, whether it is sometimes it could even be software development, it could be even translation of software from uh, our base and build new services from here into Africa. So this is one thing that could be done. Secondly, is to also use not just the FTA, but bring the FTA together with developments in Mauritius. Today, we're going to have a third cable, right? the third uh, submarine cable which makes it so much a possible thing to do here in Mauritius in terms of data center services. We could be the data center hub for Eastern and Southern Africa. So how can we bank, especially banks, and a lot of data and a lot of things that they have to keep, and how can you put it in a secure base? Mauritius is politically stable, it's, a, it's an economy that is very open, that has labor force, it can even have other resources coming in. So we could be stepping in as the uh, avant-garde platform for China to go into Africa. So let us make use of the FTA and other uh, positive things in Mauritius to get the most of uh, the, the future in terms of the Chinese-Mauritian uh, relationship. Thank you very much. Please. Mr. Chairman, I must, I must congratulate all the policymakers uh, to make this FTA a reality. I think it's a fantastic piece of work. I think it's very much now up to the uh, operators to take it forward. Uh, I think the question is uh, strategy. I, I understand from strategy is a successful strategy. How do we uh, 
take this framework and then make an, a, a successful implementation of this, make it happen on the ground. I think everything that's been said is fine, digitization, going into Africa. I think this drives our competitiveness. But we also need to be realistic. You know, we've not been able, we've not been very successful in the past in terms of our exports of services to China. I think the numbers speak for itself. I think $30 million are based on seven or $800 billion. It's, it's really mm -hmm. insignificant. I think we have to be realistic about this. I think it, it's, a, it's, it's a journey. I think we're starting a, a journey, and I think we need to tread very carefully. We've got limited resources on the island, and I think we need to be very, very, we need to be focusing our resources where it matters. We need to identify where we want to play. We can't be playing in all the 100 uh, service lines that we've just outlined. I think some thought process needs to go in terms of where, what are we good at? I mean, strategy means we must have done some work in terms of mm. what are our competencies? What are we good at? What services can we offer? What is our, our brand? And then obviously we formulate the strategy and then we drive the action plan. So my, my thought process is essentially we need to be, I mean, obviously we need to do that piece of work. A lot of work is already done in there, but if we leave it there, I get the feeling that it may develop, but it will take a, lot, a long time uh, for, for, for the services sector to develop. I think we need to be very strategic, very niche in terms of where we want to play. My sense, until that work gets done, I think it's very important that a strategic document gets done. It can be done at the, at the, at the um, policy level, uh, or it can be done at the private sector level. But because this is going to be a, a sort of, we're starting from scratch, I think some help from the uh, policymakers is going to be very, very uh, welcome. So essentially, we need to know where we want to play uh, and essentially put our resources in there to be able to drive this. My sense, without doing a lot of work, is going to be very difficult for us, Mauritian players, Mauritian operators, the likes of ourselves, to go into China and provide services. For us, Deloitte Global, we've already got a presence in China, and therefore, uh, typically, what, what, what would happen is they would refer a client. I think the key here is to identify where we, instead of waiting for clients to come to Mauritius, we know, we know the landscape. We know there is a competitive advantage by, for Chinese uh, companies to go into Africa from Mauritius. I think if we wait for the client to come back to us, I think we will, it's going to be a long wait. What we can do, we, can, we need to suss out the business model and try to start selling that business model to some of the leading players. And as and when you attract some of these brand names to Mauritius, I think that will get traction, and then obviously the, the Mauritius uh, uh, free trade agreement has got some, some mileage, and then it can go forward. I think that's to me is the. Is May the I share forward. an yeah, yeah, example please, please as a follow on from your point? So, as a newbie here in Mauritius, um, I heard about the wonderful hotels that actually exist on the island. And actually, one of my colleagues in the audience took me for a weekend uh, lunch to uh, the Lux Belmar. When I arrived there, I realized that the Lux brand actually exists in China. And it's a very successful hotel brand there. It's considered to be above the five stars in exquisite locations. And I had no idea it was run by a Mauritian company. So the brand is out there. You know, we have 1.3 million people here, but there's 1.3 billion people there in China. And they will pay the premium to go and stay at the very exotic high-end hotels. But how do we in Mauritius understand the journey that these companies have taken to be successful in China? Because actually, maybe they had done a lot of that work pre-FTA, but now that the FTA is in place and now that our hotel sector are struggling here, how could we set them up for growth? But the growth may not be in Mauritius it will be targeted in China. By the same token, if I look at the Chinese hotel operators that have given their technical know-how into the Maldives over the last 15 years and have completely overhauled the image of the Maldives as the tourist destination, if you want to be on the beach, if you are Chinese, you have to go to the Maldives once in your lifetime. And you have so many children in schools saying, I want to go to Maldives. And if they say that to their parents, their parents are like, OK, we're going to Maldives. So how do you change that tune? Now that you've been to Maldives, how about you try Mauritius? Be a bit more adventurous. There's so much more stuff to do. So it's a little bit of a two-way um, opportunity. 
whether you go from Mauritius outbounding to China or to bring some China operators here so that you can bring that some of that 1.3 billion, some, into Mauritius without damaging the oceans here. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, and in fact, uh, we were expecting to have somebody uh, in the tourism sector. Uh, at least this is one area, this is one uh, sector where we have developed, uh, I would say, like a comparative advantage, a competitive advantage over the years. And uh, there is so much that we can share. And I think that you have mentioned about you know, the management of um, hotels. We do have, in my view, uh, expertise in, in doing this, and I think that we are doing very well. Uh, and also how we get uh, as many Chinese tourists coming to Mauritius. I think that this is a problem, in fact, the number uh, has been going down, so we have to think about how to get more. Uh, about uh, air access policy, maybe we have to think about this as well. So there are so many things. Okay, my next question, in fact, uh, they have already started to answer this question. Uh, I was saying that uh, there should be a synergy between what we have done with China, that is FT with China, and what we have been doing around with so many other countries uh, at the level of Africa, with the European Union, and other countries as well. Then how really we could, uh, because we talk about Mauritius being a springboard, but what in essence, in fact, in actual fact, needs to be done to translate that into reality? Is it, it is something that you can be thinking about? Actually, a lot of that is um, already happening, yeah. but it's kept quite low profile. So when we talk about R&B clearing in the previous sessions, Actually, um, some of that R&B clearing is already happening um, through Bank of China, through HSBC. And um, just last year, we actually uh, saw 1.7 billion R&B flows through HSBC Mauritius. And that's quite a sizable amount already. Um, but there's a lot of upsides too. So rather than sometimes trying to build the perfect framework, and if we work in kind of an agile methodology, we could actually reach our goals a lot faster. And some of the baby steps, if you see it, see it that way, is already happening. Um, the other thing probably to look at is to say that actually, um, if we look for the opportunities for growth, do we have to position ourselves as the springboard to Africa? We could be the springboard to anything offshore. Right? Do we actually see a lot of Chinese businesses using BVI, using the Cayman, using a lot of other locations for their offshore professional services, uh, for their technology services? Why not Mauritius? Yeah. So it's much easier to actually get existing clients to switch to Mauritius rather than to try and find new, new business, which will take time. No, that's for sure. Um, it will take time. Uh, you know, in fact, since we are talking about positioning Mauritius in between uh, Asia and Africa, and I think in the morning in the statement of the minister, of uh, Mr. Balgobin, huh? you know, China is very strong in electronic commerce. And in fact, there is a whole chapter in the agreement dealing with electronic commerce. And uh, I still recall somebody was trying to see whether we can get uh, Alibaba because they need to set, to set up warehousing facilities. And I think at the port of Mauritius, if we can attract the Chinese uh, Alibaba, whatever it is, to come, set up warehousing facilities, and then use Mauritius as what we call uh, the real gateway to do it from here uh, to the African market. But then we have to address the problem of connectivity because extremely linked to the... And we have to see how we address the problem of connectivity. But with the FTA with China, I think that we can sit down with them because, uh, as I said, there is uh, a chapter on uh, economic cooperation as well uh, in the agreement. And we are talking about developing connectivity. Now, we are trying to do that. We can sit down with China using the FTA uh, as a framework to see how we can collaborate and then provide that maritime services that is so lacking uh, here. Of course, there is. But I think that if we want to increase the volume of trade, so that is something that we need to address. So we have to think about the warehousing facilities, 
Uh, we have to see whether uh, the current ecosystem is fine. We have to look at our legislation, and that is one question that I wanted to ask. Whether you see the need for us to now bring a new uh, legislation or to amend existing legislation for us to be able to take advantage of this argument. And I'm just giving one example, which is electronic commerce because we have done some work, and what we have found is that, yes, we do have uh, electronic payment. There are so many pieces of legislation, but we still have gaps in our legislation on e-commerce, and we need to close this gap. So the question, therefore, is, uh, if you look at the existing uh, regulatory or legal framework in Mauritius, do you think that there is a need for us now uh, to bring some amendments, to bring additional legislation uh, what is your take on this one? I don't know. You can start with yourself can, because I'm giving can, your example. If I can jump uh, into this. Um, in fact, the Electronic Transactions Act uh, that we have in Mauritius uh, talks about e-commerce, but it doesn't go into detail, and doesn't give the framework for e-commerce to really happen in Mauritius as it should, and doesn't take the new central uh, environment and latest uh, developments into, into play. So we are thinking as a ministry together with ICTA, in fact, the ICTA has uh, prepared certain amendments to it. So we are studying those amendments to the Electronic Transactions Act to be able to uh, support e-commerce. And we have a measure which has been announced in budget 2020-2021 about uh, giving tax holidays for five years for businesses investing in e-commerce platform in Russia. So. We need now to not just have budget measures, but have the proper legal environment that supports it. And then uh, from there, uh, having, uh, as you said, the uh, logistics hub that we are thinking of, if Alibaba or any other player, and we've seen that in the morning that uh, China has a number of players in that space. So they could then come here and, and make the most of the environment and then go into, into the region. So definitely, uh, the law uh, is a living animal. It has to adapt to the environment. It has to really serve the purpose and, and serve our ambitions. The more we set our ambitions higher, we would have to adapt to it. So, so this is part of, of the game. But I wanted to come back to the question of uh, assembly, and you mentioned about uh, things. In fact, we have in Mauritius certain companies who uh, are local companies. They are manufacturing uh, electronic goods from China. And uh, there are some of them which have very good brands. People are welcoming them. Value price ratio, it's fine. It's something that people are, are welcoming. These enterprises could then think of settling here in Mauritius, the assembly uh, plants in Mauritius. And from there, go into uh, our market and the, the African market, because the opportunity is huge. And we should not only think of the FTA with China. Mauritius has an FTA with SADC, has an FTA with Comesa, and we also have the FCTA. So the market of the one billion people is waiting to be served. And we need to find the strategies, and this is why I like also the, the talk of the strategy. I think after this workshop, we need to really put our minds together and really find those small niches. We don't need big things. We cannot do big things we would be just uh, losing the energy going around. But coming out with those a few niches and building the strategies for making it happen. So, so I think this is something that we need to tackle. Okay, very well, well thank you. A yes, please go ahead. On the regulatory. Yeah. Obviously, we've opened our market. So we've got overseas players coming in. Typically, my, my, my sense is, you know, the regulatory framework is very much tailored to the local environment. And therefore, now, the fact that, you know, we've got foreign players coming in, we need to make sure that there is level playing field. Local operators, obviously, and, 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 and overseas are, are operators. Therefore, there must be that review of the uh, legislative framework. Uh, I, I'm, I can only talk about my profession, accountants, for instance. We are regulated by MIPA. And therefore, therefore there must be uh, a review of MIPA requirements for accountants you know, that come from overseas so that they are subjected to the same level of standard that would be expected of the local uh, operators. Therefore, there is some work that needs to be done. I guess this is equally applicable for the other uh, professional services. Uh, so that's one point. The other point is essentially, 
I think earlier on we talked about responsiveness, efficiency, ease of doing business. And I think our regulators also need to be aligned to the new way of doing business and therefore be much more responsive because now we kind of open up and therefore, you know, when these international players come into your jurisdiction in the market, there would be some expectation that we have a standard to global, global standard. Therefore, we, there is some education that needs to happen in that to kind of make sure that uh, we scale up our capability and, uh, and, and regulatory environment. Very good. Uh, so I think that in the agreement itself, you know, there is a provision, uh, an article on what we call national treatment, where it says that you cannot discriminate. So basically, the way you treat uh, a foreigner, you treat uh, a local in exactly the same way, so you can't discriminate. It is there. But I do take the point that maybe uh, we need to have a fresh look at some of our regulatory framework. There may be a need to revisit them. Uh, and I think that one of the recommendations uh, that uh, of this, uh, not necessarily of this session, but uh, of the two-day session, would be to have a strategy document. Does that mean to say that we are going to have a big sort of, you know, document like this? It's going to be, I always say, it has to be like a cookbook. So if you want to cook fish, so it tell you take two kg of fish, uh, that much of oil, that much of salt, this is what a cookbook is. And this is what we will need. So a cookbook, a strategy document with an action plan uh, as to how really we're going to make things happen. And I take it that the Economic Development Board may be, maybe they can have uh, some sort of reflection on this one. And I think that, um, and it will take some time. Uh, so we need to start reflecting at a more micro level. Huh? Here we are having like a very broad sort of, at a more micro level, sit down, have a look at each of the sectors, uh, of the sectors, of course, and try to see what exactly uh, would be needed uh, so, to really make things happen. So yes, maybe, please. actually, so if I speak for the banking sector, um, some of this is underway. So uh, within, um, I, I know now that most people from Bank of Mauritius have left, maybe I should say, that we've been all talking about the future of banking, how banking as a sector will need to uh, evolve itself into the future and the strategy document around where do we take banking, right? So maybe something similar uh, across the other industries to actually then put that all together and say, which are the priority ones that we should focus on, given there's only 1.3 million people here. You know, we don't have the, the, the human bodies to actually do everything that we want to. But having said that, as we work through our strategy, we should also understand in the China context, what are the experiences of Chinese companies when they try to register here? What are the experiences of Chinese companies when they reach Mauritius, try to set up? What are the barriers they come across? And through those barriers, understand, do then legislation need to change to facilitate them from being successfully set up here as a regional hub, whether it's a springboard to Africa or otherwise? Because when Chinese companies, they, they're also quite low profile, so they will come here, they'll try to set up, and if something doesn't work because, you know, Mauritius is still quite European, quite French, quite British, right? So when something doesn't work, they say, right, what's the next market we can go to? Mm -hmm. You know, what's plan B? The Chinese are very practical. They're not going to sit around and wait for legislation to change. And if in Mauritius we don't know what needs to be changed to facilitate business, then we're going to not make this marriage happen. Right? So the matchmaking duties are upon all of us to actually understand, you know, so for example, do we know, uh, and this is the use of data, right? Do we know how many Chinese companies come to Mauritius in, I don't know, let's say pre-COVID in 2019, uh, and out of that total number, how many successfully set up and uh, locally registered their subsidiaries and how many didn't? And for those who didn't, where did they go? So this sort of data could actually help us accelerate much faster. Yeah, so I think that you're right. In fact, it was going to be my next question, so we are reading our mind. It's about the impediments, the constraints that we still have to address in Mauritius. It's good that you have said it. Uh, but I'm sure that there must be. And I also take the point that maybe, DB, you have already did some work because you do have a database of uh, all the foreign uh, companies because they have to go necessary to EDBD. So we need to have at least a sense. So what is it, why is it that they have come and then it has not materialized? So we need to do that. So work that certainly. It's a good thing is that 
Uh, we do have one person in, in Shanghai, so he, he's also going to help us in this one. And the next question, maybe the last one, is what do you think government should do to support the business community to be able to take advantage uh, of the opportunities under the, uh, under the agreement, especially in trade and services? Do you think there is any form of support, anything that should be done on the part of government? No, absolutely. Yes? Government has got a key role to play in this. Uh, and the way I see it uh, is essentially is obviously working on this strategy document is, is important. Also facilitating access to some other market because obviously this is going to be new for us uh, and, and therefore any assistance in terms of uh, you know, uh, connecting uh, the local operators to operators in China through uh, forums or workshop uh, and, and I think that's, that's, that, I think that's a good, good way because essentially the operators by themselves, they're so small that you know, the investment that will be required in terms of building market share in China especially can be quite prohibitive. Therefore, if, uh, you know, at the government level, I think we can have a kind of systems in terms of going to market, identifying those opportunities and connecting the local uh, players to the, uh, the Chinese operators, I think that would, be, that would be most helpful. Okay, very good. And I think that what is also important for us, because there are many countries, they want to do business with China, and maybe they have got constant. Maybe they know the Chinese market better than you. Mm. So it's also how we team up with people who maybe wants to do business with China, but because uh, they don't have an FTA that we have. So that would also be something that we need to do. We learn from them, but team up with them as well to uh, capture the opportunities. So uh, that would be another uh, issue that in my view, in our re reflection, we have, we have to think. For instance, I'm sure that Indian businesses, Indian business community in India, they would like to do business with China. I'm sure. And now, how do we take advantage of this? Or, or vice versa, eh? because, uh, so this is something that we'll have to reflect on as well, apart from everything else. Uh, well, these were some of the questions that I wanted to ask. Yes. Do we have uh, from the floor? Yes, you would like to take, who would like to ask a question to our panelists? Or on the uh, presentation I made, because I hope that by now everybody knows how services are traded. So that tomorrow if somebody asks you a question, so you can answer. <laughs> Is there from the floor, anybody would like to ask a question? Okay, I see none. Ah, yeah, please go ahead. Um, my name is Danraj. My name is Danraj Gaubu. I'm, I'm, the, I'm from distribution, value-added services technology. So I would like to ask a question. Of the 10, 10 top companies in China, we have only one company that is, has been set up in Mauritius, which is Huawei, right? The others we don't have. Secondly, uh, we, uh, we have not seen so far 25 years of business that R&D has have been set up in Mauritius, an extension of Huawei or extension of any companies that are in China uh, that can use our, uh, our, our, our brain or our people to work on, 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 like, uh, on uh, business intelligence or data science, etc., etc. So I want to know, with the FTA, how can we go ahead with all these kind of uh, technologies coming in and R&D as well. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I mean, this is what uh, the role of, uh, of EDB would be as from now on. And uh, now we do have a presence, as I said, physical presence of uh, a person from EDB. And I presume that maybe uh, we need to reinforce uh, even more. Uh, we, have, we have got one. Maybe we need to, not only in Shanghai, some other parts, uh, of China, uh, and I do take the point because there are a lot of businesses, we need to reach out to these businesses and get them to know Mauritius, maybe they don't even know Mauritius. So there is a lot of sensitization that needs to be done. And as I said, I mean, there will be a clear strategy now to have a more, I would say, substantial presence of Mauritius on the Chinese market. And I've been given to understand that in China, in all the different provinces, there has been a sensitization campaign on the China Mauritius FTA. 
So this is something which has started, which is very good. But as I said, we need now to make sure that we accelerate this process. And uh, of course, I do take the point. I mean, we do have one or two, but we need to get more. And I think that the experience that we have obtained with Huawei, we can use that same experience to approach uh, maybe the other uh, operators. Uh, but as I said, I think that, uh, that it would be up to the EDB now really to, to have a more uh, substantial presence uh, in China, taking into account the, uh, the FTA. And uh, you know, uh, there is, we are talking about the um, economic cooperation chapter. There is a whole article dealing with uh, collaboration to develop fintech. And it has to do with financial services. So we have to, we should know what exactly we would like uh, and what is it that we are going to discuss with the Chinese. And, and they are there to help us in terms of capacity, whatever you want, in terms of expertise, know-how. Uh, so they will be providing us with this because we do have a framework. The other thing is now we do have what we call a platform to discuss. Because under the FTA, there is a high-powered committee, a high-level committee which has been set up comprising of Chinese and Indian uh, and Mauritian, um, not only government, but we can also include the private sector. So I think that that platform will also give us an opportunity uh, to discuss with them. And of course, that we have to be clear in our mind, what is it that we want? So uh, I take it uh, that it's going to happen. Any other question? Uh, at the back, yeah, please. Hello, uh, my name is Rama Apadu. I'm the registrar of the Mediation and uh, Arbitration Center in Mauritius, which is an arm of the Mauritius Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Um, my question to the panel, especially, is that, as you know, trade or contracts means also dispute. Uh, that will come sooner or later. So how can a center uh, like ours, which is the MARC, which is the acronym called MARC, and .mu, of course, that's the website, I'm giving it away already. Uh, how can we be of support to such trade agreements that are going to flourish in the, in the future? Uh, bear in mind that our rules are both uh, actually multilingual. We have French, English, and also Mandarin. So how can you bring support to those trade agreements? Thank you. Uh, uh, thank um, you. I think uh, yes. maybe I can yeah, take please. that. Um, coincidentally, before arriving in Mauritius, I had to get a lot of documents notarized by a legal firm in Hong Kong. And the lawyer that I met was at that precise moment working on a maritime dispute uh, to do with Mauritius. Okay, it was a vessel. It wasn't the Wakasho, it was another vessel. Um, and I said to him, but you're sitting in Hong Kong. Why would a company pay you Hong Kong prices to dispute something that is relating to Mauritius or that is relating to a journey through Mauritius? And at that point, I had an impression that maybe Mauritius was short of lawyers. But actually, when I got here, that's not the case. So uh, there's a lot of lawyers, accountants, notaries, etc., etc., and bankers too. Uh, but how do we make ourselves relevant on that world stage? Do people even know that we have the, you know, the technical expertise to provide those services at a fraction of the cost of it being done in Hong Kong? And this is down to how we market Mauritius. Um, we need to be able to market Mauritius in multiple languages, not just English and French. We need to be able to tell people exactly what services can be done. And this is not manufacturing, this is services. Um, we, I won't say what client, of course, due to data protection, but we have, um, I've met clients in Mauritius who are third party sellers on the Amazon platform that are extremely successful, that do not use too much human resources locally, but they've set up the headquarters of their company here, they've actually become successful, and they actually uh, do a lot of business around the world digitally, right? So how do we attract more of those type of clients if we're talking about Alibaba platforms and otherwise? So that's where I think we need to do some homework to understand where is the world going? How could Mauritius play a role? Who else is eating your cheese, right? Yeah. Who moved your cheese? Who's eating your cheese? Where is the cheese? 
and we have to go and find it. And then be really, really disciplined around marketing Mauritius. I fully agree. Huh? I think that if we don't sensitize and we don't market ourselves, then there is a problem. And uh, I think that uh, now that we are talking about China's strategy, so we have to see how we are going to market the uh, arbitration center in Mauritius. But coming more specifically to your question, you know, in the FTA, there is a whole chapter dealing with dispute settlement. Uh, and, you know, it provides, you know, that you're going to set up a panel within time frame within which you will have to address dispute. But then it also provides for the possibility for the parties to have recourse if they agree to uh, dispute settlement outside, if they agree, right? So it's provided for. Uh, my friend, Mr. Jean-Louis, who negotiated this chapter on dispute settlement, maybe he would have been uh, better informed to give you an answer. But what I'm saying that there is a, uh, a whole chapter dealing with dispute settlement. There are parameters with which dispute will be uh, resolved, but also there is a possibility to have recourse to private uh, uh, dispute settlement uh, arbitration, sorry, to private arbitration. It is provided for in the, in the agreement. I think somebody else wanted to. Yes, please, go ahead. Sunil, thank you. <clears throat> and I once received a very difficult question, and I'm going to to, to put that to you. Um, you know, the push that Mauritius is doing with regard to creative industries and, and, and ICT sector, um, for the purposes of this FTA, and this is the dichotomy between the trade in services and trade in goods chapters, if you have a company in Mauritius which creates and designs a software, and then that software is packed into a CD and exported to China. That's the first limb. The second one is that software is provided virtually, and I presume that would be mode one. Um, do you see this activity of exporting of that finished product, which is a software, a trade in goods or a trade in services? And if it is the latter, what mode of supply would that be? And then I would take this a little bit further as well. If you have that Chinese customer who comes to Mauritius and he consumes that software in, in one way or another, would that be mode two or, or, or any, other, any other way? Thank you. Yeah, you know, so long as it is done electronically, the first time you develop the software, transmitted electronically, so it's going to be mode one, right? Uh, it's a classical example of mode one. And if it's going to be the Chinese cons uh, customer coming to Mauritius uh, to consume that service, so certainly that's a classical example of mode two. So we are talking about cross-border in any way, in both cases, because even uh, the other one that is mode two is also like a cross-border, because, well, it travels, so the person travels to consume the service. Uh, so that's how it's, so the, for, the, for, the, for the first question that you asked is going to be uh, mode one for the second question that you have asked, uh, for the second uh, example is going to be mode two, right? Now, but uh, the, what is important in all of this, the CD thing, that you are doing something, uh, you have produced a software, uh, what you need to make sure that this software is not copied, you know? Uh, and here is the CD itself, because we are talking about a physical product. So that would be trade in goods because you have still to sell the CD. But the content on the CD is not trade in goods, it's trade in services. We are talking about a software. And normally a software uh, will have to be protected. And for this, there is a whole agreement on intellectual property. And basically we are talking about copyright. And when we talk about copyright, we talk about printed books, that we talk also of services in terms of software development and uh, uh, data protection. So all of this basically would fall in the universe of copyright. Uh, so we are talking about so the CD per se is going to be trading goods because if you buy a CD, you know you can tax it or whatever it is. The content on the CD is going to be trading services. <coughs> Thanks. Uh, I think that we are a bit pressed. No? time so i would like really to thank our panelists so uh
Round of applause for them. Yeah, I'd like to thank them as well on my side. And I hope that now you know what is in the agreement when it comes to trading services. You know how services are traded. And as I said, uh, I said that we really need to have like a strategy document, like a cookbook, and we need to do that. I think that after this, we will have to sit down with EDB and see you know, how we prepare this document with timeline and with clear action, uh, the government support and everything else will be in that document. Thank you very much. Dr. Bidu, thank you so much for having um, moderated this panel. Thank you to all the panelists for their interventions. Moving on, ladies and gentlemen, it is to my pleasure to invite Mr. Daniel Esu, the Chief Executive Officer of the Mauritius Bankers Association, who will moderate the next panel entitled Trade Financing. Mr. Esu is the current Chief Executive Officer of the Mauritius Bankers Association. He has more than 15 years experience in the financial services industry in the UK and in Mauritius. He also serves on the Council of Business Mauritius, the Mauritius Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Financial Services Institute, and on various consultative councils on financial services. Mr. Asu holds an MA from the Cambridge University. Mr. Asu and his team, you are kindly requested to come on stage. Before I start, um, can I have a show of hands for who's been here since this morning? Well done. Can I have a show of hands for who's been here since yesterday? You're very brave. Well, <laughs> I, I have some, some good news for you. In fact, the first piece of good news is that um, this session, the one that I is about to start, will be slightly shortened, which hopefully, <laughs> which hopefully brings the prospect of networking cocktails closer to you. Uh, the second piece of good news is that you're about to discover things about trade finance. When I told my wife that I was coming to lead a panel on trade finance, she said, who's interested in this? So I would like to request the EDB to take a picture of everybody here because you, you've made it this far, so I can send it to her. Thank you. Um, and today, to talk about trade finance, uh, we've got a very good selection of people. We've actually got uh, two people from the banking sector and two people from business, from people who actually do business uh, that, that banks then support. Um, and we're going to talk about the general opportunities uh, that are opened up with this treaty. We're going to talk about the challenges and really what needs to be done next. So hopefully that will be uh, of interest to you and we'd welcome your questions at the end. But um, before we start, I just wanted to draw your attention to this uh, room. And I hope that I will get a picture for my wife um, at some point today. Most of the things you will see in this room have been imported. And the majority of these things, even the flowers, uh, probably many of them were, were, not, were not produced locally. And the vast majority of that will have been imported from China. So every single one of these items has needed trade finance. So the thing is actually around us, it's everywhere. And it, it's a part of everything we do. Anyway, I will now turn to our distinguished panelists. And before we start, I'd like to ask them to introduce themselves one by one so we know whom we're talking to. So starting with Daniel, perhaps, from, from the right and moving on. OK, thank you. Um, so my name is Daniel Lamchen. I'm, I'm the coverage executive for Trade and Development Bank. My name is Ahmed Parker. I'm the CEO of Star Nitwer, a garment producer. I'm Natalie Danes, uh, Head of Sales and International Networks of DTOS, management company headquartered in Mauritius. 
Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Sunil Ramgavin. I'm the head of uh, I'm the head of corporate and investment banking of, of Absa Bank Mauritius. Thank you very much. I, I, I did look, and it did say four panelists. So I think I think that's about right. Thank you. Um, so to, to kick off the discussion, I just wanted to ask each of you in turn. Um, what you thought this new uh, agreement opened up in terms of new opportunities. So maybe starting with Sunil, just to, to mix and match the order a little bit. <coughs> yeah, uh, th uh, thank you, Daniel. I think uh, this, uh, this new agreement, this FTA, uh, is going to be a, a, a really a good kicker uh, for the development of Mauritius uh, and the Mauritius jurisdiction, not only for the local industry, but also for the global business sector to present Mauritius as really a hub between Asia and Africa. We have been speaking about that for quite a long time, and I think this is going to really be uh, a good spoiler in the, in the, uh, in the taking off of the, of the trade between the two continents. That's my take. Thank you, Natalie. Um, to highlight what uh, you, 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 you just said, I think that um, the FTA is um, a stepping stone as well for the China-Africa corridor. However, um, I think that we need to communicate more. Um, Chinese uh, in China, Mauritius has been seen as a tourism destination more than a financial destination. Despite we are working hard to promote Mauritius as, a, as an IFC. Uh, and uh, as uh, this morning uh, the, govern, uh, the governor said, there, there are two pillars. So the, the, the flow of goods and services and the flow of capitals. So the, the flow of capitals, we need to understand that that is really an opportunity, especially not only China outbound to uh, maybe using Mauritius going to Africa, but also I think there's an opportunity for Africa to go into China. There's a lot of uh, import-export doing by African uh, entrepreneurs that we can also um, attract in Mauritius. Thank you. Ahmed. Uh, I think that... Uh Yeah, basically, uh, the trade agreement is a huge boost for us. Uh, obviously, it will take time. The reflection of the benefits will take years to come. However, we as exporters, for instance, manufacturers in Mauritius, using Mauritius as a base, uh, the biggest issue is trade barriers. Because when we export for brands, international brands, we export throughout the world. For instance, today we work with a brand where we export to South America, China, and the whole of Asia. And the problem is the tariff barriers or the tariffs that exist in different destinations creates a lot of documentation. And that documentation creates time uh, impediments, creates cost factors to be accounted for. So this trade agreement definitely eliminates that factor. And China being one of the largest potential markets, as was mentioned, I think that's a huge boost for us to try and enter that market. But again, I come back to the points that were made. We need to understand, because to rush into a market without knowing what are the other impediments, we need to have support, and that's where EDV or the government of Mauritius with the government of China have to assist us to fast track elimination of obstacles. I think that we as operators, we don't have huge amount of money to spend time with lawyers and or with trade facilitators to find solutions. We want to export our goods, we want our goods to reach the final client, and we don't want to have any obstacles in between, because that costs money, it can cost demerage, it can cost all sorts of things. But I'm very confident that through services, through manufactured goods, and even being a, a, a translation point, Mauritius into Africa, which is another objective which can be developed, I think this is a very good, good development. Thank you. Daniel, do you have any, any thoughts from your perspective? Um, yes, of course, I think this uh, new FTA will provide um, uh, better access to new markets. And as TDB, well, uh, investment grade development finance institution, uh, we represent like 40% of Africa, which 1,600 million population. Uh, and, and our member states, they generate uh, an aggregated turn, uh, GDP of $800 billion of GDP. 
So I, I believe that this new FTA can, well, we, we need to use this new FTA to create new sectors in Mauritius to boost the economy. Uh, so there's a huge demand for pharmaceutical products, uh, new technology. So for example, uh, in, in DRC, they are one of the uh, largest exporters of copper and cobalt in the world. And it's really high quality copper that they export. Why can't we use Mauritius as a platform to add value to these products and then to export to China? And vice versa, why can't Chinese companies set up, uh, uh, establish regional manufacturing plants in Mauritius mm. and use um, Mauritius uh, uh, agreements which we have with Comesa and SADEC to penetrate the African market? And TDB will be financial of, of, of Comesa and we can facilitate uh, all these trades. <laughs> Well, that, that takes us very smoothly to our next round of questions, which is really about uh, the financing needs. So we've talked about a number of opportunities here, whether about movement of goods, about the global business and the regional integration through TDB. So the next question is, what financing needs do we foresee in terms of additional needs? Uh, we currently have some trade financing, but really with a focus on trade finance. Maybe I can start again with Sunil. Uh, I think in the current economic circumstances, and everybody is very, uh, very careful about risk, uh, up to now there has been a lot of trade done on open accounts, and the trend we are seeing in the market is each and every counterpart is looking for a uh, uh, type of security and secure transaction, and they are looking more and more at trade transaction uh, via documentary collection, be it letters of credit, standby letters of credit, and so forth. So I think this is a trend which is going to, uh, which is going to continue in the next two years until uh, we build that relationship and confidence between the two parties. And, 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 and this is going to be key. And I think we as banking institution, uh, we've, uh, we've heard uh, Bernie speaking about uh, the long presence of uh, banking sector in Mauritius, and we as APSA being long present in Mauritius and in the African continent. And we have been, uh, we have been quite active in that trade documentary transaction. Uh, I think this is where uh, I think we are going to bring value add services uh, to the counterparties in the trade business between, in, uh, between China, Mauritius and Africa. This is the trend which is, which is happening. Thank you. Natalie, would you like to, to add to that? Yeah. So indeed, um, trade finance uh, ne uh, need to be, I mean, in the beginning, trust need to be built between importers and exporters. So indeed, trade finance can help to mitigate really? risk, uh, also to, to help uh, exporter to, um, to benefit from, uh, to, to accelerate the cash flow, I mean. Uh, but however, I believe that we need to distinguish the different type of uh, Chinese uh, companies. First of all, the one who are going outbound, we have the state-owned enterprise and we have the private-owned enterprise. Um, it's different needs, different types of uh, uh, destination, different types of target markets. So that is the first thing. And the second thing is for the our Mauritian exporter. I believe that if they want to export to China, they will need to uh, produce more in terms of quantity. So in terms of working capital, um, they will need more working capital. So they will need the bank support for that. Uh, so a strong balance sheet will be also <laughs> needed as well, I believe, <laughs> for, uh, for them, yeah. We, we do our best. Um, Ahmed, yeah, perhaps, sure. and especially I think in your, in your industry, I think what's interesting is you have quite a bit of inbound business as well in terms of importing materials, yeah, et cetera, sure. and then also outbound yeah. exports. So maybe from your, your very sort of um, specialized uh, perspective, can you talk about the, financial, the financing needs that, that will change with this FTA? Sure, I think the, the first thing is the issue of the currency fluctuations currently which is creating a very big inflation in terms of the risk side of it. We can't predict, you know, an Mauritian rupee has depreciated, which we can't complain, to be honest, as exporters. We've benefited because we are obviously gaining. However, 
as we're going to do in China, and China is our largest supplier on the uh, accessory side, uh, there's no reason why we can't deal in their currency and therefore mitigate that risk because then they also are not exposed so much. And as most of that conversion is local and raw material is local, this could give us a benefit in the longer term in terms of our purchasing. The other factor is market intelligence. You see, when we go into a market like China, it's so big. Our knowledge is very limited. And I think a big work that can be done is to get to know the market. And that's where the role of EDB can come in to do a networking for us as operators to give us access to different producers and give us uh, opportunities. Even now, we attend European fairs, American fairs, but we, don't, we rarely attend a Chinese fair. But China is uh, uh, one of the leading global players in supplying us in our supply chain. So I think there, there's a big work to be done now to create that connection. And that connection will give us an ability to do better sourcing, to have a closer relationship to our suppliers, to know them better, and to put in place like we have credit insurance today. Credit insurance assures us the protection that when we expose ourselves can be both ways, and even for our suppliers. Let's say most Chinese suppliers tell you pay cash up front, even before they produce. So that's an impact on our cash flow. And it's, you know, currently we're all working under tight cash flows. So when you get to be paid, paying earlier, and the reason is they have no visibility on us. But if we could create this platform of credit insurance that works both ways, that will relieve that cash flow because then some amount of open account can be done because they will have the assurance that should we fail, they will be covered. So there are many parts of this chain that have to be uh, fine-tuned. What's happened today is that the opportunity has been created. Now to, to basically concretize that opportunity, we as operators need to come forward and, and elaborate on how we work now, how that could be improved, and find ways of interacting with the stakeholders, government, uh, here and in China, and seeing how. We look, we're still going to remain small on a global perspective. However, we can still be a niche, because today IPs are being created in Mauritius. We've created an IP where we'll sell in China. Now, that can become substantial. So the problem we find, like when we sold in Sri Lanka, in Pakistan, there are local issues of uh, bureaucracy. So, so a free trade agreement does not necessarily mean that all the, the, the constraints of operating in that environment are removed. So this is the area we have to parallel to opening and start selling in these markets to start looking how to remove those obstacles. And, and work with the operators that we have visibility and build up a business plan which has a proper follow-up on all levels. And it has to be fast track, as Bonnie mentioned. A guy comes here, he can't spend six months waiting for a permit. You know, if we say we have a predetermined criteria, if I want to get a license to open a company and these are the compliances and I comply, my license should be issued. I don't need to have to ask so and so. So that's the same application that has to work the other way. So I think these are the areas we have to, to work on, which will help to grow the business much faster. It's not only about the commercial advantages. The ease of doing business, which we talk about, is a key factor in the expansion of trade and the benefit of this trade agreement. Thank you very much. And we can already hear a few themes emerging here. Uh, an expectation of increased volume, so working capital financing. We're hearing about uh, RMB fluctuations and that sort of currency management. And then, of course, you've talked about some barriers, and we'll come back to the, to the yeah, barriers sure. in a little while. But I just want to turn to Daniel, because his bank has a, a regional outlook. You know, I think we've talked about the financing perspective, the operator in Mauritius, in import and export, but you look after a number of markets, and with Mauritius as a as a pivot, so to mm -hmm. speak, for regional a regional gateway. So, do you what sort of uh, financing needs do you see arising from this FTA? Yeah, I think to uh, unleash the full potential of this FTA, um, clients will need financing from the whole spectrum. That is, first, I think they will need capital. Uh, they will need long-term financing and then tailor-made uh, trade finance solutions because each industry is different and the capital, working capital solution will vary from industry to industry. And I believe that uh, banks are here to support the clients and to provide uh, tailor-made solutions. 
Thank you very much. So, before we, we get bogged down in, in finance, I really want to talk about um, the, the challenges. You know, I think and Ahmed talked about them. Maybe I can turn to you again in terms of the sort of financing gap, because today, obviously, uh, the needs are there, the opportunities are there, but there, there is an argument to suggest that there may be a, a financing gap. So, can I, yeah. can I invite yeah. you to share I, your I views on the, this? I the, think there are two elements to look at. First, pre-COVID and post-COVID. Uh, today, most of the operators are working under huge duress in terms of managing their cash flow. And that's in all respects. Eh? We're not, uh, most operators have suffered. Very few people have come out unscarred from the COVID effect. So when you talk to retailers today, or people who transact, who trade, they all face this problem of when would they buy, how much would they buy, and you know, stock levels at a minimum level. The issue we face in Mauritius, which is not necessarily faced in China or in India, is that we have this supply chain, and that supply chain is linked to, the, to Asia. So to make a, a garment in Mauritius, I need to buy an accessory <coughs> in China. So that lead time now is longer because air freight is impossible. There's no accessibility today because we don't have a proper air supply. The cost is substantially higher. Sea freight, as you know, has gone up massively. So the cost of that element itself has risen. So now we are facing an issue of reorganizing the logistical part of our business to try and source local. That means local means South Africa and so forth. So China will always remain a key supplier because they offer you the variety that very few countries can do. So we can't say that we'll substitute China. So how do we sort this issue out of the connectivity, the financing, because obviously now I may need a lot more early uh, on, on, the, on the basically on the eve, because bars are buying short lead times. They're saying I want something in four weeks. So my supply in China has to react fast. Now the first thing will tell you, pay me up front. So that means you have to find the money to pay. You haven't been paid yet. You'll be paid after 60 days from transacting this whole order. So this is an area we need to adjust, and that will be where we have to work on both fronts, on our frontier, but as well on China, to build the confidence that they can supply us to some extent where they are secured of being paid, even on an open term. And that is, that is an issue we face today. And it's going to get worse, because I don't believe that the trading conditions post-COVID will become much easier. I think that it is going to become more demanding. That's very interesting because very often we've considered the working capital element to be slightly distinct from the trade financing instrument. But what you're saying is actually they're, they're two sides of the same, the yes, same equation true. and actually we need to, to, to manage the, the full cycle and see how the trade fits into that. Uh, Natalie, do you have anything to add from your clients' perspectives in terms of the financing gap when they're, they're transacting and conducting sort of trading, trading um, activities? So, as I said, um, there are two different types of Chinese clients, the state-owned enterprise and the private-owned, and that is a huge difference because basically for state-owned enterprises, it's quite easy for them to obtain a, a, a corporate guarantee, so banks can uh, let them have a credit line, uh, whereas for private-owned enterprise, it's more difficult, as I said, uh, um, maybe in terms of corporate governance or compliance or balance sheet is not as um, per the bank requirements. So it's often quite difficult to work with the banks either in Africa or either here in, in, in Mauritius. Um, and I think for also the, 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 the domestic uh, markets, the, the Mauritian markets, uh, if they want to export or in, import uh, from China, uh, probably that the local banks need to uh, work closer to, with their counterparts in China, uh, because we are not only talking about HSBC or Bank of China, they are more banks, I believe. Um, yeah, and uh, as he just said, uh, the, the, the working capital and the, and the cash flow are the most important uh, part for, the, for those companies. Yeah. And I think that's something that many people in this room who are involved in business will, will sympathize with. I think this difficulty of, of maintaining the cash flow and just making sure that you're getting the supplies in. But at the same time, the, the banks also have their, their constraints. And there's often an expectation gap between, you know, uh, 
an operator needing financing and saying, well, I've got this business there, I need some money to make it run, and what the, the banks are also able to do. And I just wanted to invite the bankers, maybe starting again with, with Sunil, in terms of you know, the constraints of the bank and that expectation gap. I think th uh, some of the constraints that you may uh, uh, bank would look at, one is uh, the wrong way FX risk that we will need mm -hmm. to manage. I think we have spoken about security, uh, in terms of how do you enhance your security package in order to make that a bankable uh, trade transaction. But in, reply, uh, in putting up these challenges, uh, I, would like to, uh, I would like to also point out that uh, from a banking perspective, we have got some mitigating factors in terms of when we speak about uh, security, if somebody is not able to give uh, corporate guarantees or whatsoever. So the way we need to have a look at it is structured trade transaction, i.e., how do we uh, look at the end-to-end -end supply chain financing, but at the same time, uh, we call that collateral management mm -hmm. that we need to uh, appoint to follow the, uh, the, the, uh, the goods. The other, the other constraint is uh, on the legal, cross-border legal regulatory framework that we need to take into account. And I was very pleased uh, from a question uh, earlier that these are things that we will need to have a look at. But I, th I think from a banking perspective, uh, we, we as bank, I think we are financing partners. It's, it's a question of sitting with a client, understanding the need, providing the advisory uh, solution, and tailor-made structure, transaction structure to each of the client to make it happen. I think this, this is the way forward that we need to have a look at. Thank you. And, and Daniel, uh, in terms of that, that gap, uh, et cetera, anything you're, you're seeing? Yeah, um, well, today uh, there's a trade financing gap of $100 billion in Africa. So why is that? I think many banks, they have limited risk appetite for Africa because they don't know the market, it's a difficult market. And I think in order to, to close that gap, banks like ABSA, TDB, and HSBC, who knows the China market very well, we need to try and work uh, together and find the solution for the clients so that we can boost the trade uh, financing. Well, that, that takes us very neatly to the last, the last round of, of questions on this, and it's really about the solutions. You know, I think we've talked about the opportunities, we've talked about uh, the need, we've talked about the gaps, the problems. So what, what is there? You know, what, what actually can be done today? And so maybe I'd like to invite, as this is about trade finance, maybe, maybe the banks. And again, I will start with Sunil from the commercial bank perspective and then turn to you because you've got the more supporting sort of regional support, it's a slightly different perspective. So, so Sunil, maybe. Uh, from, from an APSA perspective, something which is very important is, one, uh, we are present in 10 African countries and we have uh, a collaboration agreement with SOGGEN, which enable us to cover almost the whole of the African continent. And being, being present uh, in each of the country help us to build and control and put the right transaction structure. Over and above that, we have got a, uh, we have got a Chinese desk sitting in SA, uh, whereby we have got people speaking Mandarin, and, and I think language is a barrier, but I think we are getting there, which will help uh, to uh, ease the, the, the type of transaction that we need to have uh, in, uh, uh, in China. The other piece is the relationship on large trade transaction with export credit agencies, be it in, uh, be it in Mauritius, so uh, be it in, uh, in Europe or be it in China, we have got that relationship in-house whereby we can get credit insurance or ECAs to back trade transaction to make, uh, to make things happen and to create risk mitigation. I think these are the type of things that we need to work more closely and with partners to make that happen. So it's really about coverage, expertise, and credit enhancement, insurance, and risk mitigation. Uh, Daniel? 
Um, well, I think sometimes um, clients made the uh, mistake of not coming to the bank at the outset uh, to, 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 so that we can brainstorm together and find the right solution. They just knock at the door of the bank, asking us, for example, to issue an LC or to provide them with a short-term financing. But if banks are involved at the beginning of, of a trade, then we can structure the whole financing. Uh, and of course, at the end, uh, it's, the, the client will get a new structure, which will also benefit uh, from this new structure. Uh, and as mentioned by, by Sunil, there are other products which we can uh, put in place if we are aware of this project at the beginning, like export credit agencies, insurance, so that we can also bring other international banks in big trade financing uh, transactions. And do you work with other banks? Do you have a sort of bank of banks sort of product structuring role as well? Or? Yeah, so we, we're not here to compete with commercial banks. We like to partner with commercial banks and in all transactions that we do, because we have only six offices uh, across the continent. And for example, when we do a transaction in Madagascar, we'll partner with a local bank there. When we do some other transaction in, in Zimbabwe, we we'll also partner with a local bank there. So, so our, our, our uh, operating model is quite different from commercial banks. And uh, as, as we, we, we proceed on the African continent to bring transactions, we work together with commercial banks. And, and, yeah. and maybe for a final word, can I invite Natalie to say, you know, in terms of uh, other solutions for, for clients looking at that, any, any thoughts? That, you know, we've talked a lot about problems, but what can we do here to, to support clients? So, uh, first of all, DITOS is a regional service provider. Uh, we are a business uh, in a blur with uh, a, a strong footprint in East Africa and in Middle East. Uh, we are present in Madagascar as well. Uh, we have a rep office in Shanghai. And for the last 20 years, we are working uh, with that China-Africa corridor. And in terms of st structuring, we really encourage our clients to use Mauritius um, as a treasury center uh, because uh, we have a very sophisticated banking system in Mauritius. Uh, we believe that uh, to, to, to obtain a credit line here is cheaper than in Africa. So we are really pushing our clients um, in that way. Um, else, we also... Um, support them and help them to enhance the corporate governance and the compliance. Compliance is a huge subject nowadays, especially to obtain a, a credit line with banks. So we really try to put more substance in the, the company here based in Mauritius. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'd like to, to thank our panelists for, for their perspective. I think we've had a very good sort of overview of, of the opportunities and challenges that, and products available. I'd like to ask your, your very patient selves whether there are any, any questions in, in the room for our panelists. Any questions? In which case, no, we're being shy. So in, in that case, I'd like to thank you for your, for your attention. There's only one session left to go before, before the drinks await you. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists for their perspective and wish you all a pleasant end of conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Esu, and to all the panelists for their participation. Ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to invite on stage the members of our last panel for a discussion on the trilateral axis China, Mauritius, Africa. The panel will be moderated by Dr. Yusuf Ismail, the Secretary General of the Mauritius Chamber of Commerce and Industry. While they are getting ready, uh, the team will also do the setup. <laughs>
Good, can we, can you hear me now? C'est bon? Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Well, I took some time to get ready because we were in agreement with the panelists to have an agreement with you. The agreement is if you fi I find you sleeping, I will make this session long until sundown. Eh? If I see all of you awake, that's the recommendation from the panel. If you stay awake, we'll have a very short discussion ready for your cocktail. So this is the last agreement, and I'm sure this is the shortest agreement we can have between two parties. Well, um, this session is an interesting session because it's the wedding season. We have signed with China. We have signed an agreement with India recently and with Africa. The African Continental Trade Agreement came into force on the 1st of January, creating a single continental market for goods and services with a free uh, movement of business people and also investment. And also uh, expand in terms of intra-African trade and also settlement of disputes. Well, I will just go back before I start uh, with the uh, discussion with the panelists. Just a brief history going back to the future. Trade between China and, in, and uh, Africa is not new. It goes back 200 years before Christ, where they found settlements in Mogadishu, in Kilwa, in Tanzania, in Ethiopia, Zimbabwe. And there were two major routes to this trade and it's being recreated now. The first route is the Belt One Road, which at the time was called the Silk Road, uh, which was called the Ceres at the time. And the second route, which is concerned us, was the Indian Ocean Trade Route, which was called the Sinai uh, Route, Sinai Southern Trade Ag Agreement at the time. So the trade goes back well in time. So we're not reinventing. Uh, it's something that has happened. But what is different is what we will dis discuss today. Uh, I will ask the panelists to, first of all, to introduce themselves. I understand we have one of our counterparts who have a translator. So briefly, I will ask uh, Mr. Allen to introduce yourself. Yep. So my name's Ian Valentine. From yesterday, you probably know me from the presentation we made. I'm a principal consultant with Huawei, dealing with digital transformation and media products. Allen? Good afternoon, I'm uh, Alan Yang from uh, Qingfei Smart City. Nice to meet you here. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Robin Daji. I'm the managing director of Upsa Bank Mauritius Limited. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mahendra Wujia, director of the Ministry of Finance. Uh, well, all over the two days, we have discussed trade. You need to do the English. Hello. So uh, I am Mr. Li Hai, uh, and uh, I am from Shanghai, China. I am uh, currently in charge of uh, have development of a project in small city in Pai in cooperation with SIC. Thank you. I think over the last two days, we have discussed about movement of goods and trades. We have spoken about services. I think it's an important component which I haven't touched at all in that session. It's about investment. So I'd like to call upon uh, Mahen from the Ministry of Finance who has worked tirelessly on this issue of investment, a, a specific chapter on investment between uh, the two countries. Mahen, I understand you have a short presentation. 
The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Yusuf, and uh, good afternoon, everybody, once again. Indeed, uh, I think over the last two days, we've been hearing a lot about uh, trade, trade in goods, trade in services, trade finance, and then also specifics about trades, trades in uh, ICT, in professional services. And then uh, if you look at the FTA, it also comprises a chapter on investment. So. Uh, why trade and investment? We know, everybody knows here that uh, these two are quite interlinked. Trade goes along with investment. Now, when it comes to investment, and uh, we're speaking about cross-border investment, there are quite a number of issues that business people uh, face. Issues like, you know, uh, whether when they uh, export goods, whether these would be subjected to some sort of barriers, tariff or non-tariff barriers. If uh, an investment is made in a foreign country, uh, how are the income going to be taxed? So uh, you've got issues of market access, and then you've got issues of risk, which is associated with uh, cross-border investment. Now, these issues can be tackled in different ways, by means of uh, bilateral by the business person himself, uh, through having uh, appropriate contractual terms, or through adopting the appropriate risk management strategy. Otherwise, government comes into play, negotiate with uh, foreign governments, and establish framework ag agreements that will be conducive to both trade and investment. This is where FTAs come. This is where bilateral, industries, bilateral investment treaties come. This is where double taxation avoidance agreements come. And uh, uh, I'll, in a few minutes, uh, talk a bit about what we have negotiated in the cha investment chapter. But then a uh, few things to bear in mind. Currently, we have an investment promotion and protection agreement with China. It was signed in May 1996, but with the coming into force of the FTA, uh, the investment chapter is going to replace uh, that uh, investment promotion and protection agreement. Now, uh, the investment chapter, what it uh, covers, it covers the post-establishment phase of an investment, not the pre-establishment phase. So uh, this is what has been agreed between the two parties. Uh, it focuses on risk mitigation as a mean to provide a framework which is conducive to cross-border investment flow. And uh, it applies to investments which, which are known as covered investment, which are defined as covered investment. And what are covered investment? It is investments which are in existence prior to coming into force of the investment chapter, or prior to the coming into force of the FTA, as well as investments that would be established, that would be acquired after the coming to force of the uh, FTA. It also, the, uh, what we've negotiated in, in, in the uh, investment agreement is in the investment chapter, uh, provisions to deal with potential risk that investors face when going cross-border. Now, among the issues that are, they are faced, they may be faced with treatment which is not in their favor, which is discriminatory. That is, uh, domestic investors are treated differently from foreign investors. You may have situations where uh, an investor of a third party is treated differently from another investor. You may have issues of security security of assets, you may have uh, issues of security to the person, to the investor. You may have conditions being imposed uh, upon the investor, that is, that he has to use local raw materials, that he has to export a certain percentage of his production, that he cannot uh, place on the local markets. You've got issues about transfers of funds, profits are made, uh, incomes are generated, but then when it comes to transferring back the fund, 
There may be issues of foreign exchange control. You may have issues of expropriation. So what we have negotiated in the agreement and agreed by the two governments is, first of all, under Article 3, which deals about national treatment, uh, which also uh, is a provision that is found under the services chapter. Now, the national treatment article guarantees that the investor will be accorded a treatment which is not less favorable than what companies or nationals of the other party obtains. Meaning that if a Chinese investor comes here, the Chinese investor will not be treated differently than the Mauritian investor or a Mauritian company. So the actual provisions read like that. It says each party shall accord to investors of the other party. It's not only to the investor, but it's also to the investment of the other party. Sometimes there's a confusion whether the protection is given to the investor or is it given to the investment. So in the chapter on investment, it covers both the investor as well as uh, the investment. So it says that each party shall accord to investors of the other party as well as covered investments, treatment which is not less favorable than that, it accords in like circumstances to its own investors. So uh, I think it's quite clear that through this provision, there's a guarantee that's given that there won't be uh, discriminatory treatment insofar as uh, uh, with respect to nationals are concerned. Then in Article 4, we've got, uh, Article 4 deals with the most favored nation treatment. Here again, it's uh, not with respect to local investors, but it's with respect to third-party investors. The article guarantees the same treatment as what would be accorded to a non-party, to a third-party investor. But then there are exceptions to that. Uh, maybe uh, later on we can talk about the exceptions. Then we have under Article 5, again, dealing with uh, non-discriminatory treatment, but this one, it speaks about fair and equitable treatment. It guarantees that all investors and investment will be treated fairly and equitably. And converted into specifics, it, for example, speaks about providing full protection and security to the, to the investor, which requires each party to provide the level of police protection required under customary international law. Meaning that if you've got a situation of strike, then whatever police protection would have been provided to a domestic investors, a similar protection uh, would have to be provided. The foreign investor would, have, would be entitled to similar protection in terms of uh, police protection, I mean. Uh, then we have Article 7, which deals about expropriation. It prohibits expropriation, but except if certain a process is followed. So it doesn't mean that expropriation cannot be done. But then the basic task, it guarantees, it provides protection that the foreign government is not going to expropriate or nationalize a covered investment, and that it goes on uh, deeper to say that whether it is direct expropriation or indirect expropriation through measures equivalent to expropriation or nationalization. So it covers both direct expropriation or measures that would be equivalent to expropriation. There's a guarantee that this will not be done, but then there is an exception. And where this exception applies, then expropriation becomes lawful. So for expropriation to be lawful, there has to be a process to be followed. The due process of law has to be followed. It has to be, the expulsion has to be on a non-discriminatory basis. It's got to be for a public purpose, for public health, for example. And then the investor will have to be consented, compensated for whatever losses that may arise out of the expropriation. Then we've got Article 8, which speaks about, which provides protection to the investor for repatriation of funds. It speaks about free transfer of funds. So it says that each party shall permit all transfers relating to a covered investment to be made freely and without delay 
into and out of its uh, territory. And that also, that transfers is to be effected in a freely convertible currency. So what sort of transfers are permitted? Contributions to capital, profits, dividends, capital gains can be freely transferred. Uh, the investment chapter is actually divided into two parts, into two sections. Sections A, section A deal with whatever I have just read to you. In addition to that, you got some other provisions, provisions like transparency, that is provision of information about laws, regulations governing investment. It also uh, provides uh, protection in terms of subrogation when uh, insurance come in. But then there is also the possibility for uh, one of the parties to deny benefits of the agreement to an investor if certain conditions are met. So there is a denial of benefits provision in the agreement as well. And then the section B, the section B deals with dispute <coughs> settlement. Uh, but the dispute settlement, it's only uh, one side, it's, it's, it's investor state dispute settlement. There's no provision for state state dispute settlement in the investment chapter. And uh, the mechanism that is provided is initially for a period of 180 days. Uh, normally there has to be consultations and then uh, this is known as a settlement by amicably, amicable settlement. So there is uh, some consultations that goes on. I'm reminded about the time, uh, just uh, two minutes, uh, I'll end up. And then uh, the most uh, important uh, provision is uh, the possibility to go for international arbitration as a mean for resolution of dispute. But you can go for international arbitration only after two years of the 24 months after the lapse from the date on which a claim arises, a claim for a dispute arises. So it's only after 24 months. In between, you have to use the amicable means of settlement or else domestic remedies that are available under the law. Thank you. Thank you, Mahen. I had an agreement with the audience, so I'm trying to be uh, on time. I'd like to move on to Mr. Daji, Arvin. The African line is rising, yet intra-African trade is very small, especially in terms of services of goods and investment. As an African bank, uh, which is Amalg Amalgamated Banks of South Africa, which is APSA, how do you see uh, this trade agreement uh, going to facilitate investment from China to Mauritius into Africa, but also into the different regions of Africa? and vice versa. Thank you. I think you started your comment talking about low intra-Africa trade. And, and that's true. If you look at globally and the, the global, uh, uh, globally, the regional players you've got and, and the different markets you've got, I believe that Africa lags behind in terms of the intra-country uh, or intra-countries uh, uh, approach from trade. And, 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 and these are for many reasons, uh, Ismail. Uh, uh, it's also around what services and goods are available for export within the continent, but also the different uh, trade agreement you've got within the countries. But more importantly is, uh, is the, the quality of the place. When I say quality is when you look at the shape, there, there are very few big players that trade intra-Africa as well to the small. And if you look, uh, you know, the, the question of trade finance and the gap of trade finance uh, uh, came up in the previous session. Uh, but if you look at what is being done today, 80% of those money funding goes to 10 players. So that's it's one of the main explanations is that the small players do not get the opportunity if they have the right services, but also from a, from a uh, funding pers perspective. Now, your question also asks about how do we get the flows better between the two and what role Mauritius could play. And if you look at the, the reason why flows happen uh, uh, in this corridor, which is an important and growing corridor, I would say there are three areas, uh, trade finance, and that's been spoken about, FDI, Mahen covered that uh, uh, lengthily, and then the third is aid. Uh, uh, that flows mainly inbound into Africa, as, as was 
And, uh, and if, you, if you then uh, look at aid, whether Mauritius could play a role, I, I think very little. It's made mainly G, G to G. So I think we could, we could take that out. And trade finance and FDI is important to make sure that we get a, a platform that support. And if you, if you look at what should happen and what, what is required, I would say four things we need to look at. You've got a payment system. You've got financing. You've got risk management. And then you've got data. Uh, and, and let me start with the last one, data, which is critical uh, uh, to ensure that the rest is done properly. Today, and, and, and somebody was talking to me earlier on to, to say, when they have to open an account here in Mauritius for a Chinese client, it might take a week with Bank of China or two, but with, when it goes to other banks, it takes ages. And the, the answer is because there's the availability and accuracy of data is difficult to get. So I think that's where it's important to make sure that the due diligence is done and there's a platform that allows banks and other companies, other counterparts, to look at uh, 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 exporters, importers in China and Africa and to ensure that you get the data ASAP as quickly as possible, not only from a compliance perspective, but even from a commercial perspective. So building a framework uh, and a platform to ensure that due diligence on counterparties is done quicker is important. I think payments uh, has been touched a lot during, during the day uh, from LCs to open accounts. Uh, but I would argue there's one thing that is important in payment to, to, to look at is speed of execution. I think, uh, um, and, and, and again, you know, a lot of people blame us banks that we take a long time to do due diligence, KYC, and so, and so on. And, and of course, we've got a license regulated by, by, by authorities and we need to, to make sure we follow those. Uh, and, and, uh, but again, we believe that digitalization could be one of the solution to that. But also, I think for small players, I guess a uh, platform like PayPal and Google Wallet could be used more to enhance that, especially for medium to small size players to, to use that. And the last point, uh, the, the, the true point is around financing and risk management. Uh, and again, all banks want to lend more. All banks want to, to finance more because that's our business. That's what we make profit. But clearly, um, risk appetite is an issue. And why it's an issue, and I, I would argue again, especially for um, exports to China, and if you have to pre-fund uh, 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 products before this export, there is weak credit worthiness of, with a number of players. I've told you 80% go to uh, uh, 10 players. The rest, there's a weak credit worthiness that we need to get better at as banks, but also there's lack of collateral. And again, there, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's important that we find a way and which, which kind of go to the last point around risk management to, to ensure that how do we uh, uh, look at mitigating those risks through uh, some of the, of, the, of the guarantees that are available from the FIs. And, and, and the, the last point I'm going to talk about the finances is an issue of liquidity in many countries, a hard currency liquidity. And, and there as well, I think the question of RMB has been raised, but I believe, uh, I think RMB contribute to less than 10% today of all exports or imports into China. And I think that proportion should go up and should go up massively uh, 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 to ensure that, uh, that there is both inflows and outflows on RMB so that that could mitigate the dollar uh, 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 led or biased uh, uh, transaction, which also creates a different problem when it's so much dollar based, is that cross funding banks are difficult to deal with, especially when you're dealing with medium to small entities. So, so it's important that we get that diversification, diversification away from dollar as far as, as quickly as possible to, to, to uh, uh, promote more of the flows. Thank you, Arvin. May I now turn to Mr. Lehigh? Mr. Lehigh? Um, the question I have for you is, what are the components of the trade agreement is about property development in real estate, of which you have a spot city in Mauritius. How do you see this area developing, you know, from the investment from China into Africa in terms of real estate development, but passing through Mauritius. Uh, 
中国毛里求斯，非洲那毛里求斯实际上是不良的作用。那么毛里求斯这边，我作为一个中国投资商来这边，也已经很多年了。首先是对这边的一个自然环境，是吧？人文的这些素质啊，以及这个国家的一个法治国家。政府的这种强有力的执行力，吸引了我到这边来做投资。So, uh, for a country uh, to be an attractive location, for example, in my case, uh, it is very important to consider several factors. Uh, some of these factors, for example, is depends on the uh, government's uh, support, the culture of the area uh, into which we are going to invest, and then also the different channels and the facilities that will be provided. 呃，这我们和这个国家投资公司 SIC 的这个，我们礼拜的这个智慧城的这个项目，从这个洽谈，呃，整个过程的时间也是经历了比较多的年份了。So, uh, between, for example, our cooperation with the State Investment Corporation of Mauritius SIC, uh, the whole discussion has been taken, uh, taking a few years, for example. 那么，借着这一次的自贸协定签订，我想这是一个新的一个学业的一个输入。那么，对我们的项目的这个往前这个推动，一定是会带来一个大好的这个好的好的这个呃推动作用。So, for example, with this introduction of the FTA, we are sure that this will be like new blood that will be circulating into the system. So, it will definitely enable our project to advance forward. Domenibai, this智慧 Center project, we were invested in a idea is to create a Mauritius life, enjoyment, leisure, and work environment. 把它营造成一个非洲的后花园，对毛里求斯的治安、这个自然环境和这个呃各方面这个政治各方面都是非常稳定的国家，呃，可以称为是非洲的瑞士。So, for example, in our case, uh, in Domenlepai, when we decided to invest in Mauritius, we were looking at the small city as an opportunity to have a work, live, and play option uh, for all the people around. So Mauritius can be like a gateway or, or actually like a window of how a possibility to invest into Africa, what it might look like into the future as well. So for me, it is Mauritius is a little bit like the Switzerland of Africa. Through this kind of investment in the real estate market, through this way, let Chinese and Mauritius more understand each other, through these trade-offs, through the economic cooperation, so that we can understand each other. So, in this way, we can be in the Mauritius market. 智慧城的这个后花园，也可以向这个非洲这边下一步做一个推广。So, uh, Mauritius can be also like a backyard, a back garden, uh, to enable the trades, uh, to develop into from China through Mauritius into Africa. This is, uh, would be able to enable both countries and uh, both areas to develop, uh, very well. 我们易海公司呢是非常看好毛里求斯这个市场。因此，我们在一八年也投了一个新的一个一个标，呃，是路易港移民广场，呃，综合公交车站的一个项目，想通过那边那个项目，把它打造成一个贸易的、技术的和这些人才培训的一个呃平台。So, for example, on top of the smart city project, uh, another real estate project, whereby we have firm commitment into the Mauritian uh, real estate development, is that in 2018, because of our belief in the structure of Mauritius as being a very stable area to develop further real estate, we have invested and attended for a project in uh, Port Louis, the capital city, which is uh, immigration square, urban terminal redevelopment. 
we are hoping to use, for example, this project as a platform to showcase the possibility for the trade and also to develop the human resources training and uh, a platform so that people can uh, link between China and Africa. It would be a bridge between the two places. Mauritius,目前在Mauritius,作为直接投资的公司,应该是这个经费,我们也是很好的合作伙伴,加上我们一海,还有华为,这些中资公司, 我想一定会带动毛利球斯的经济有一个发展。So uh, through our two projects, and uh, we are hoping that we can move the whole uh, development of the economy of Mauritius forward. So apart from our investment as a private company in Mauritius, of course there's also good cooperation with our fellow partners like uh, in Jinfei and also under the company like Huawei, which is uh, contributing to the development of Mauritius by Chinese companies. Into this region. We can say, so we see in the GSR, uh, don't know the small shading that you get a total to the you get Paul who the you get Tison, uh, she died a year to look near to make a total to the you get Paul who the you get you get shading the you get 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 you so as uh, the doctor uh, mentioned earlier, it is uh, very reassuring that the FTA has even strengthened the protection for the investment for external parties. So Mr. Lee, uh, uh, I am uh, much more comforted now and also will encourage other investors to invest into Mauritius as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lee. Hi, sharing your experience in terms of property development and investment in Mauritius. On the same topic, I'd like to move on to uh, Mr. Allen, who is the general manager for uh, Jinfei. What do you see the role of Jinfei in terms of attracting investors to domicile the headquarters, to tap in the opportunities between the two countries? So I think Jinfei have an important role, I understand. Yes, thank you, Dr. Mel. As you know, Jinfei was planning a smart city in Mauritius since uh, uh, 2006, already 15 years. So total, we already investment uh, more than 100 million USD. In Jinfei now, 211 hectares of land, all the infrastructure now is ready. We have uh, three targets in Mauritius. We want to be, uh, build up, you know, one belt, one route, success case, uh, investment in uh, Mauritius. Second, we want to um, bring the, all the Chinese entrepreneur investment in Mauritius. And the third, we want to become, you know, use Jinfei platform, become the international investment uh, uh, business platform. This is our three tar targets. We have four product, project uh, in Jinfei Smart City. First, we focus on the culture tourism center including the Eden Garden Cultural Tourism uh, Center, five-star business apartment hotel, Marina plus Nati Villa, Chinese and Mauritius entrepreneur, entrepreneur uh, beach house, and also we have a water park project. This is the phase one. Phase two, we focus on the Sino Africa Financial Service Project. We already cooperation with the China Singda Group. We set up a 200 million USD foundation fund in Mauritius. Uh, since last year, we already put 20 million USD. So now we also want to welcome all the Mauritius investor, Mauritius entrepreneur, join the project uh, to build this fund success. And also, five years ago, we br bring Bank of China to Mauritius 
Our governor from Sanxi Province meet Bank of China CEO in Beijing. We sign strategic agreement to build this financial hub in Mauritius. So five years later, now as also I will uh, discuss with uh, Bank of China to make this happening. So we received four, five hectares of land for them, build Sino Africa Financial Service Hub. And third, we're planning logistic center. This is also, we'll, after sign T, uh, F, FTA agreement, this we're planning three hect, three, 35 hectares of land in, in Jingfei. We, we will build more than 40 to 60 warehousing logistic center, use the modern time facility, will service uh, Mauritius local market and also will service uh, uh, Africa. Uh, you know the big uh, group from uh, France, uh, Decalon, already set up the largest warehousing in Richtel, uh, nearby the Jinfei. So I think we, we, this uh, logistic center we are attractive to a lot of uh, uh, new Chinese entrepreneur to join the platform. For example, like uh, Alibaba, our headquarter office, already cooperation with uh, Alibaba. We will invite them to, after the COVID, we will invite them to Mauritius. So all of this business opportunity, I think will benefit to Mauritius and the Chinese investor. And of course, we, we're planning the education hub. You know, Mauritius have very good environment. Uh, a, lot, a lot of intelligent people speak English and French, and also have a, lo a lot of uh, <clears throat> business opportunity here. Our, our business model is first step, we bring Chinese investor tourism to Mauritius first. Then second step, we want to attract it to the family, to Mauritius. Then all the Chinese investor will working, living, and play. So this is our philosophy. So, and of course, we cooperation with the American campus. We set up an education hub in Jingfei, attractive to more than 300 students from Africa, uh, India, and China. So this education hub will be real attractive to uh, all the business people work together in Jingfei. And, uh, and the last one, I want to, uh, I have a suggestion. Because of uh, six years ago, we have a gym. We want to set up a renminbi uh, investment and uh, fund in Mauritius. Because of Jingfei, we investment more than $100 million. In China, we need a currency exchange. We need a renminbi change to dollar, then dollar change to ruby to Mauritius. We lost a lot of, uh, a lot of capital. So Jingfei project is G2G project. I hope Mauritius government can support Jingfei, set up this, this fund. Make Jingfei project become the showcase in Africa. Make Jingfei project become the first smart city in Mauritius. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. The message is clear. We are not going to do it, but we are already doing it uh, in Mauritius. We need to accentuate and quantum leap in terms of what you're doing, uh, Alan. I'm going to move on to uh, Ian Valentine from Huawei, another Chinese company. Um, we talk about airline connectivity, we talk about maritime connectivity, but in terms of trade, investment and services, we need this digital connectivity. Yes. And I think uh, not just that, but also Africa needs a lot of software, they need to have a lot of digital uh, system put in place. Yeah. And also we need to pro, uh, create products uh, for Mauritius through Huawei to export into these countries and, and, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Maybe to have your take and your experience from Huawei, what is the way forward in terms of digital, digital connectivity, in terms of product development? And yes. So forth. Well, when I think about what my friend here is doing with Jingfei, uh, it's a very big infrastructure project, a civil engineering project. And my friend here from Absa Bank, you know, is he a South African bank or is he an African bank? And we, we, we come to Mauritius because there's a reason, right? But the revolution is not about civil engineering or the old financial system. It's about digital transformation. Because I think what's really happening now is a huge acceleration. 
with cloud computing, we're able to have unlimited resources. We're able to not care where we are. And what I see with uh, Alibaba, for example, mm -hmm. coming into Jingfei, Mauritius can act as a bridge between the Western clouds and the Chinese clouds, right? Mauritius can act as a, a data um, freeport, if you like, where you can have jurisdictions of various different representative countries like Europe, America, China, Africa, existing in an interoperable way, all together here with the software developers, the Chinese entrepreneurs, the European entrepreneurs. When you look at European software development, American software development, quite often they're outsourcing to China and India. And what better hub is there than to do it here? So you asked me about the, if you like, the, the digital infrastructure. Obviously at the lowest level, it's cloud, right? And I think the ability to host east and west clouds together is crucial. The next part of it is the communications through to the industries that are being worked on. The smart ports, the smart roads, the travel, and Mauritius is already well advanced for that. The, the big thing I think is going to revolutionize Africa, however, is in the financial sector. You know, this exponential digitization of the economy. The thing that holds back, and we've talked about it already in Africa, is inter-African transfers. Right? There's a wave coming, a, a, a huge wave of what you might call the internet of money, the financial services in the cloud, DeFi. And there's an opportunity for Mauritius um, and maybe our banking partners, our infrastructure partners, to grab on this new wave of cloud technology and actually use it from Mauritius to unify Africa where it cannot be unified before where instead of having to get all the different jurisdictions, all the different financial systems to talk to each other, we can use this new kind of technology, cloud, DeFi and the financial services, talent, software development, to actually take Africa into a trade block that, that rivals China, Europe and America, right? Without some kind of political union, yeah? It's gonna come through technology. And I think if the right parties are talking together and with the right government support there is here in Mauritius, Mauritius can be the catalyst for this, mm -hmm. the catalyst for this uh, unification of Africa as a force on the global economy. But it'll come through not civil engineering projects or old institutions, it'll come through dramatically using these new technologies. And I think Mauritius is where we pioneer it. This is why it's so exciting. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, uh, uh, Ian. I can hear the word Eastern cloud meeting the Western cloud. That's a perfect, perfect storm for success, I understand. But I think, uh, like I said to you, we, we are a bit pushed for time. I'd like to open the floor for any question that you may have. It's an interesting debate. Um, we, I know we are running, off, of running out of time. But any, any question from the audience, whether it's on investment, whether it's on work, live and play, whether it's digitalization, smart cities, or on investment. I'll leave the floor to anyone have any questions. No? Anyone? Okay, um, maybe, uh, maybe just a, a, a last question thrown to all of you. Um, in terms of uh, the, the axis between, I'm going to throw in another uh, aspect. We have a lot of trade agreement now. We have uh, India, SEPA. We have an agreement with Turkey, the only African country to have an agreement with Turkey. We have with Pakistan. We are in negotiation with Indonesia. We are uh, already with Africa. We are in Comesa. We are in SADC. Is it too much? <laughs> Uh, in terms of this trade agreement, to be to stay focused. At some point, we have all these ecosystem being built so quickly. How do you, uh, you know, in terms of resources, in terms of planning, how focused are you? I mean, there's so many things happening. Anyone? Yeah, my hand. Yes, uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, I think uh, when you look at uh, the various agreements that uh, you just uh, quoted. Uh, each and every one, 
It's not that uh, one contradicts the other. It actually reinforces the other. You know, uh, businesses, like we are saying, uh, you, you are trying to position the country as uh, a platform for doing business. And you've got uh, Chinese investors probably using the, uh, the platform and then uh, also roping, going into Africa, for example. So necessarily, there has to be, the, the linkage has to be there, the linkage between Mauritius and Africa, and then the linkage between uh, China and, Af and, and Mauritius. This is where, when you have uh, arguments such as bilateral investment treaties, double taxation avoidance treaties, it has got to be uh, uh, along, you know, the whole chain has to be there. So you cannot simply have an agreement between uh, China and uh, Mauritius uh, that would help in, you know, taking us to uh, the uh, target where we are uh, trying to achieve, the objective that we are trying to achieve. So it has to be in this way. So I don't think that, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's too much. Actually, uh, each one reinforces the other in, in creating the environment which is uh, conducive for doing business. If I, if I may add to this, I think I think there's a lot of agreements, uh, and uh, and uh, it's is making sure that we benefit from those agreements, and then real trade or payments happen. So, and again, there are short-term uh, things we need to do, um, and, and also long-term, and and I think we need to reflect around, uh, and and it depends how you argue whether um, EU with a single currency has been a success or not. I don't know, uh, you could argue different ways. But I could also say that one of the reasons that investment into Africa is difficult to get through is because of so many different currencies in, in the, in, on the continent and the fluctuation the, the, is so much. So whether we should argue for a monetary convergence uh, in a number of countries in Africa is something we need to think uh, and maybe it's not a short-term uh, plan, it should be long-term, and I think it's important we get that right um, and, and, and address the issues that investors see when they invest in Africa, be it political risk or this, but one of the risks that they're looking at more is the currency risk, availability and, and fluctuation, whether monetary convergence should it be uh, something we should be thinking of in the future. But I think to stay in Mauritius, I, I also believe that attracting in the financial services, a number of international players is critical. And some people argue, small country where you have 20 banks. If you go to Singapore, 168 banks. So, so there are places, in my view, a lot of places for people that could look at cross-border and, and on the global business sector. So I think it's important that we get a lot of more international players to build credibility, but also to ensure that those who a look at uh, through correspondent banks that looks at flows and, and our issues. If you have more local players here, uh, I've, uh, international players on the, on the local market, that will reassure a number of those correspondent banks to ensure that flows happens and happens quickly without much hindrance. Okay. Um, I know we are a bit pressed for time, so I'll take this opportunity to thank uh, our impressive panel, uh, three Chinese companies doing business in Mauritius, one bank from Africa, and also we discuss about investment, a key uh, uh, aspect of trade and finance when, when you have investment. So I'd like to thank Ravin Daji from uh, Absa Bank, Jan Valentine and Alan Yang, Mahen Rawatya and Mr. Lai, and also uh, the translator, which I didn't get, get your name. So a big round of applause to yourself because you've been patient with me. And also to the, the panelists. I'm going to leave the floor back to the closing uh, session and the cocktail is, is awaiting you outside. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to you, Mr. Yusuf and all the panellists. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of our workshop. On behalf of the Economic Development Board, I would like to express our appreciation to all moderators, panellists and presenters for both days. Our thanks goes to you, dear participants. It was indeed a pleasure for me to be your MC during uh, the workshop on the Mauritius China FTA. You can also download all the presentations during the workshop on the EDB website. You are now all cordially invited to 
to a networking cocktail, which is being held at the restaurant. I wish you all a great evening. Thank you.